All right, like I said, good evening and thank you for joining us. Um, you know, one of the things that I really wanted to do with this program is share some of my experiences with you. When I get phone calls about trees, the white pine is probably the tree I get the absolute highest number of phone calls for. Um, it's usually anywhere during the warmer seasons from spring all the way through now, I will probably get at least five phone calls a week and that's on the low end about a white pine problem. Um, these trees are planted pretty much everywhere you look, regardless of where you live in Indiana. But unfortunately, there are some problems with this particular tree choice. And I'm going to try to illustrate those a little bit for you. Um, this is not to say that this tree isn't a great tree. I love seeing white pines. I think they're gorgeous. But unfortunately, there are some problems. So a little bit of information on this tree. Uh, the reason it's so great, I kind of lay out here, it's known for really, really quick growth. If you want an easy windbreak or some background scenery, or if you just like pines in general, this tree is a great choice. You can put it in the ground and it will come up very, very quickly. It is the only five needle pine that we have here in Indiana, which means it makes it very easy to identify. You just look right at the little branches and you can see a a little um, protuberance that will have five pine needles sprouting from it. And it is the only tree that will feature this particular uh, set of needles. But the problem with white pine, the reason I get so many phone calls that I do is that it's kind of unpredictable. You can have white pines that will sit comfortably in your yard for five years and then all of a sudden they die for no apparent reason. And they also have their own sets of diseases and insect pests that can make life for a white pine very difficult depending on where you are in Indiana. So originally, a lot of white pine was planted because it was used quite a bit in construction. And in fact, you can still find a lot of log homes that exist today, or some that have even been recently built that will still incorporate white pine as a part of its construction. Um, I actually grew up next to a home that was like this. The outside, you could tell very easily, the uh, outer paneling on it was entirely white pine. Uh, primarily today, though, we've moved on from that particular pine as a construction material. We use white pine as a specialty wood and furniture for the most part. So it still has some value. You're not going to be pulling in major dollars like you would with walnut or another veneer tree. Um, but you will see some people will still go ahead and farm out white pine for that use as a specialty wood. It's great for being adapted as a finishing wood or even for a repair. Uh, I don't see that very common with the construction things that I have seen, um, but it does happen. So that you, like I said, you can still get a decent amount of good value out of this tree if you're growing it for that purpose. Now, there are some issues when it comes to white pine in Indiana, though, and I want to go over some of those with you a little bit in detail because a lot of folks don't understand why we have these issues with them. And a lot of it is due to how they are adapted to the environment. Now, white pines can adapt to a lot of different soil types, but they unfortunately have a tendency to decline when they're in soil types that are just too far away from what they're able to handle. And in the area in which I live and work, I live in Terre Haute, I work um, in two counties. One county has very, very high levels of clay in the soil. The other county has high levels of water. Um, and then the county I live in, of course, is well known for its sandy soil types. These soil types are going to sometimes cause problems. So researchers tell us that this tree is going to tend to favor coarse and sandy soils with really good drainage. And I want you to keep that in mind, especially if you live, say, in Monroe County or if you live in Owen County or a county that has a very high aquifer, you could be, fa <coughs> excuse me, you could be facing a problem with maintaining your white pine in that area. White pine are also really sensitive to competition. They aren't like a big old man oak tree that you're going to find will just kill everything around it and survive for a significant amount of time. White pines need a good clear area to be able to develop. Uh, this 
This is most likely due to their sensitivity to changes in soil pH and their ability to uptake nutrients, though I would want to look up more research before I guarantee you on that one. Now, if you are planting white pine in wet soils or soils that have heavy clay, that's where you start running into problems. Um, I originally come from an area that has high clay content, and you, you simply didn't see much in the way of white pine where I grew up. Um, and one of the counties that I work in, in Clay County, I get calls about white pine decline constantly. It is a continuing problem. Uh, that type of soil just does not do well for white pine. As the soil productivity increases, white pine will be less successful due to that high competition factor. So as your soil gets more and more nutritious for plants, more plants are obviously going to try to take advantage of that, and then that's when that competition gets started. And say if you live where I do in Terre Haute, we're a tree city. There are trees everywhere here. Right out my window, there's an oak. I have two dogwood in my yard. And what that is going to happen is squirrels are going to take those oak nuts. They're going to plant them all throughout my yard, and I'm going to spend next spring pulling them out. Well, in a situation like that, white pine is going to struggle because oak trees are generally very successful. So they're going to be fighting against that competition. And in general, they're going to lose. They just simply aren't going to do well in that situation. Another problem you see, and this is especially true in clay soils, or if you are trying to grow on land that was previously used for, say, farming, soil compaction is going to represent a major problem to the development of white pine. They need that good, loose soil to be able to get good root spread throughout and to be able to grow very successfully. A lot of times when people try to do a transplant of white pine, they don't understand why it doesn't go anywhere. A lot of it has to do with soil compaction. The root ball just can't begin to spread and the tree honestly will just choke itself off and die. So all of this leads to this concept of white pine decline. And this is something that we extension educators deal with probably nine times out of 10 when it comes to a white pine problem. White pine decline is that culmination of all the negative elements that can happen within an environment that leads to the tree beginning to have a lot of these symptoms you see here. We'll see paling or yellowing of the needles followed by browning of the needle tips and thinning. Now, unfortunately, this also can look a lot like different white pine diseases. So I'm going to cover a couple of those diseases to help you guys get a little bit equipped for what to do when you see it. As white pine decline occurs, you're going to see needle drop during summer and spring, and then new needles are going to be very short. And then one thing, and this is something I want you guys to focus on, is that you're going to see the new growth is shriveled. And you'll also see that the bark gets the shriveled appearance. Imagine your skin on your fingertips if you take a bath or a shower too long, or if you're in the pool for a while. You see that your skin shrivels up a little bit, and it looks funny. Well, if you look at the bark of a white pine that is in decline, it's going to have a very, very similar appearance with lots of grooves, and it looks, it looks like it's just having the water sucked out of it, and it's shriveling up so much. That is a very, very easy sign you can use to tell if decline is occurring to a particular tree. Now, eventually, that tree is going to begin to lose its interior needles, and that means that the tree has now lost food supply, and it's not going to be able to survive without it. So what will happen is a lot of the other symptoms may begin to happen very slowly over time, and oftentimes, we simply don't notice it, because if we're not out checking our trees very regularly, it's just not something that is going to occur to us to look at very often. The decline really jumps into full gear once those interior, interior needles begin to drop. And then all of a sudden, you're noticing that the tree is now lacking food, so it can't survive much longer at all because it doesn't have any energy it can use to make it through really harsh seasons. I'm fully expecting to get several phone calls here very soon because we're essentially coming out of a drought period, and a lot of these white pine probably didn't survive the experience. Um, most likely, the signs of their difficulty is going to become more and more prevalent as we begin to enter the colder, colder seasons. And as a reminder to everyone here, and I know I have a few gardeners and master gardeners on this one, um, our first frost date is coming up next week. So we got to keep an eye out for these things.
I believe October 11th is the estimation, roughly a five day period after that. So I wanna cover some of the white pine needle diseases. Now I don't encounter these as often, but they do occur. And I wanna make sure you guys have at least a little bit of information on them. So our first one here is white pine needle disease. And this one is fairly common. It's more common in states north of us, though it does happen in Indiana. What you'll see is that the needles will begin to brown. Now note here, I say not yellow because when I was showing you what happens to decline, the needles will begin to yellow and then they will brown at the tips. In white pine needle disease, the, the needles will brown and then you'll see very, very limited development of new needles. The new growth will be stunted. This situation is caused by a complex of different environmental conditions and pathogens. There are about six or seven different pathogens, primarily fungal diseases, that are going to contribute to needle disease. Um, I considered putting them in this, but I realized it would eat up a huge amount of time if I went over them. And unless you are a specialist in that area, you're probably not really so much concerned about the nitty gritty on this one. You're really probably more concerned about what you can do to stop it. Now, the signs of white pine needle disease sometimes don't appear for up to a year because what you're looking at is the development of different environmental conditions stacking on top of infection. So it can take time to actually culminate in something that you're gonna say, hey, I have a problem here and I need to solve this. And I'm not going to put in major efforts you can do to try to prevent this yet. We're gonna go through a few more diseases first before we dive into that part. So white pine blister rust is another one. This one's probably the easiest one that you can uh, begin to notice. And I want you to look at this picture very, very closely. Uh, Mike Grabowski has actually done a lot of work with trees. A lot of the images that I've used have been his in the past. Um, and you can really tell he did a great job taking this image because it really details the disease great. The bark is going to develop a canker that's going to begin to crack and swell on branches. And then you see in this previous slide here, there we go. You can see if you look at some of the needles in the background, you can actually see some kind of orange or brown color developing on those needles. But really the easier thing to focus on is looking for the cankers on that bark. And if you actually look at the bottom portion of the branch in the image, you can see these little yellowish pods hanging off of the tree. These are actually how the, the disease creates spores. As the disease progresses, it's going to create these little pods or pustules. This is where the blister name comes from. And they're gonna release spores, these orange colored spores into the environment. And I kind of ran over my slide a little bit saying that. Um, but that basically kind of summarizes what this disease will do. And unfortunately, it is a fungal disease. It can spread very easily. And it's also going to spread very easily when it is wet. And as you, can, as you know, we've had some wet periods this year, not recently, but they have occurred. So a little bit about the disease management. And this, is, this goes for any white pine disease that you're encountering because just about all of them are fungally based. You want to plan to prune any diseased portions of the trees when it is safe to do so. You wanna make sure that you're not fully damaging a tree that's developing, but at the same time, you've still got to take care of it. Um, in the case of a fungal disease like blister rust, you're probably going to want to prune the branch before it gets within about four inches of a trunk. So that way it doesn't begin to spread into more of the tree's vascular system. That way you're only costing yourself a branch, you're not costing yourself an entire tree. You also want to do your best to try to reduce the moisture on the needles. So if any of you have been to any of my gardening programs, I have probably filled so much of your time saying, give good spacing to your plants. And this is very true for white pine. This is why they don't do well with competition. This is why we want to make sure they're nice and spread because if water splashes between the trees, that means that a fungal pathogen can spread using that water. Bacterial pathogens will also spread though. Those are, I believe, not quite as prevalent in white pine. So it's not like you're going out there with a blow dryer to dry your tree off. It's more that you are planning your landscape to try to manage this disease. You want to make sure that you have good space to allow airflow in between trees 
and you're doing uh, the best you can to prevent movement of pathogens in between those trees. Keep in mind though, when it comes to any fungal disease on any plant, as when those spores begin to release, it's all up to nature at that point. So you wanna try, if you have something like blister rust, you wanna to try to remove disease limbs before those cankers really begin to develop and begin to be capable of spreading spores throughout the area. Okay, so I've kind of gone over this a little bit already, but I wanna hit it again just in case. So white pine does not tolerate drought or soils that retain water very easily. They have a very, fairly narrow band where they're gonna be very comfortable. And unfortunately this year has kind of just been all over the place and probably not a good year for white pine. Um, we've had some drought conditions which can cause the soils to become harder to work with for the tree. And we had wetter conditions earlier in the year and we had a little bit of water retained in our soils. And there are still some areas that probably have some more water retention that we'd expect. Last, set, last week or so has been a bit rainy. They're going to have a high preference for slightly acidic soils, and that is not going to be the case for a lot of Indiana. If you're in Owen County, you may not have that benefit because there's so, many, so much high limestone content. There are a lot of old strip mines throughout Clay County, which are going to influence the acidity of the soil. If you aren't from my counties, check on what your average soil pH is. Contact your extension educator and talk to them and they can help you figure that out. And as I say down here, just at a brief glance at our web soil survey, most Indiana soils kind of fall outside that optimal range, both in terms of how well we maintain water and how well we do with the soil pH. So that means that if you're choosing to plant a white pine, you're going to have to be careful about your choice and you're going to want to baby them a little bit if you want the tree to survive very long. Excuse me, I needed some water. So some of the other abiotic factors, the factors that don't have to do with living things that play into this is honestly pollution, human pollution. Um, the icing salt would be considered a part of this. We spread the icing salt on our roadways and our sidewalks because in Indiana, you can't survive the winter without it sometimes. Uh, what'll happen is, is that the de-icing salt will come off of the roadway. It'll get swept by runoff effects and various other things and come in contact with the soil that white pine's gonna be in. And it will cause injury to the trees as it begins to leach into the soil. Um, you'll see trees that are going to thrive for years on your property. And believe me, folks, this is common. This is a call I get a lot. We will constantly get calls of, I've had a white pine in my lawn for 10 years and it just fell over dead. Um, and I can't even begin to describe how often I hear that. And it's a very, very sudden and rapid thing. And I've kind of told you already why that is. It's the tree has been declining that entire time. It's just all of a sudden, all of the problems culminated at once between a lack of food and the suboptimal soil, and then the tree just died. And unfortunately, that's just, that's hard to avoid if you plant it in a terrible condition. And sometimes those conditions may not be immediately evident. evident. I'm going to share one story with you of a client that I worked with. He had a beautiful white pine. It was planted um, near a gorgeous lake that he had on his property. And you could tell the way the soil was sloped that water couldn't possibly be retained there because it was on a downslope. So the water was flowing into the lake. The white pine did great. And then in the last year, it just died. It fell apart. Leaves, all the needles came right off of it and it died. And when we took a close look at the bark of the tree, um, yeah, it had the telltale signs of white pine decline. Most likely movement of water caused a shift in nutrient content. The tree probably started experiencing competition from other species nearby it. And the soil acidity probably wasn't quite right for it. And he lost the tree. So even though you think the tree is in a good spot, it might not be, and you need to be prepared for that. All right, some of the biotic factors, some of the factors that have to do with living things. Um, for those of you who are more accustomed to my work, you know I'm an entomologist and I love insects and most of these biotic factors are going to be insects. They have their own group of them that are going to hit them, though they share this generally with most other pine trees and there are some insect species that are not going to care if it's pine or whatever, they'll go after anything. But most of the damage done by insects is going to be primarily boring damage. They're going to bore a hole under the bark of the tree 
and plant their young there so the young can have a food source and then eventually hatch out and travel to other trees. Bark beetles are one of our first culprits in this situation. So what bark beetles do is they're very, very tiny. Um, you may have heard of these beetles before or dealt with them yourself. They're rather infamous amongst trees and entomologists because they are one of the sources of Dutch elm disease, which eliminated our elm populations here in the States. Uh, bark beetles, for the most part, do not carry much in the way of serious disease for pines, though they can spread blue stained fungus. Um, what they do is they are, they're very, very hard, little tiny beetles that you will look at and you'll go, this is just a little black bug and I don't care. What they do is they're going to bore a little hole into the tree and their grubs are going to survive under that bark until they hatch out as adults and then just spread around. And you can usually tell their presence because they give this really telltale appearance here. Of, you could see their galleries underneath these openings that they form and you can look right through them. If you go to a lot of antique shops, there are some people who actually value a lot of the antique woods that have this appearance, uh, which I found particularly funny. My wife and I do some antiquing. Now, this is just one of the different insects that we deal with here, unfortunately, but bark beetles are common in pine and in other trees as well, as evident by their presence in elm. Pine sawyer beetles are actually a little bit prefer preferential. These are a group of beetles known as longhorn beetles. The antenna are referred to as longhorns. Uh, these guys are also boring insects that are gonna lay their eggs beneath the bark of the tree. They're really, really terrible though, unfortunately, as most longhorn beetles are. They can have larva populations so high that you, if the tree is infested at the right time of year, you can put your ear against the tree and hear them chewing. And that's how, how bad they are. And the larvae are quite large compared to like a bark beetle's larva. They're going to form galleries underneath the tree of, as well, though it's not really going to look much like the bark beetle's effect. They're going to be more under, directly underneath the bark. Um, if you had emerald ash borer attack any ash trees and you saw the damage they did, it's going to look a lot like that. Now, they're not quite as bad as an emerald ash borer. The damage is the same but they aren't as virulent. They aren't as damaging to the tree as they are for ash. It's entirely possible that a tree could survive a pine sawyer, but it's definitely gonna be in trouble afterwards. And they actually spread pine wilt nematode. Uh, nematodes being a type of worm-like organism that's a source of a lot of disease in various plants. All right, this one, this is the culprit that I'm always fascinated the most with, and sometimes I hate it the most. Uh, the white pine weevil is one that leaves really telltale signs of its presence. Um, we deal with weevils in all kinds of areas in uh, crops and produce, um, and they can really, really do a lot of damage when they want to. And in the case of our pine trees, what they're going to do is they're going to cause this telltale shepherd's crook, where the tips of the apical um, branches are going to start curling over into kind of, an, an, and they're going to look like a shepherd's crook. The, bore, uh, the grubs are going to bore into shoots and they're going to cocoon in those twigs, which makes getting rid of them very, very difficult. Now that's true for all the insects I've discussed so far. Spraying for them at the right time is nigh on impossible because they're protected under the bark of the tree. Ultimately, with weevils, you're going to see boring holes, though they're not going to be nearly as prevalent as you will with a pine sawyer or a bark beetle, but you will begin to notice the dieback on the twigs. And of course, those larvae are tucked away safe, making it difficult to get rid of them. And here's an example of what that shepherd's crook looks like. Now, I can guarantee you that a uh, white pine weevil is in my area of Indiana. I have seen trees that are displaying this tendency. Um, you can even see them from the road sometimes if you look carefully enough. So you definitely want to watch out for this trait. Now, unfortunately, trying to eliminate these insects, like I said, can be challenging. You're going to find all kinds of products that will be labeled for them. And you're going to find that a lot of times they're going to be pretty hit and miss. I generally believe that sanitation is going to be your best bet in trying to take care of these insects. If you have infested trees, you're going to need to destroy them and remove them to protect the younger trees nearby. 
And when you do that, you can burn them, chip them, or bury them. I personally believe in the burning or the chipping. I don't think burying these is necessarily a good idea. Some of these insects are very, very resilient. Um, the sanitation efforts you can take are going to be most effective between October 1st and April 1. So we are now in that period of time because this is when the insects are going to begin going dormant and the trees are going to be entering their more dormant period, so making them less viable to become infested. You want to focus on those evergreens that have half of their branches completely brown with needles. If you have a tree that has over 50% of its needles gone brown, that tree is most likely not going to survive and you will need to take some kind of action um, to eliminate it as a potential threat to the other trees around it. All right, so in terms of lessening the decline itself, and we're going back to white pine decline here, uh, and in general, just tree management, this is true for many trees, consider your site selection. A lot of problems, whether it's white pine decline or even just disease or insect spread, can be handled through good site selection. Check with your neighbors, see if they've had issues, plant your trees with good space between them and check how your soils do their drainage and what the soil content is. There are lots of tools you can use to figure out what kind of soil you have on your property and we extension educators know what to do to look for that. So we can help you out with this. You want to avoid those soils that are going to have a very high pH content because those are the moments where you're going to see chlorosis become a problem. And in that case, you're gonna see needles begin to change colors and the tree is going to just already be in trouble. You also want to try to plant away from roads, not only to let the root system is expand like it says here, but to also avoid any effects of pollution like the de-icing salt that I mentioned earlier. You, these trees need space, they need to be babied a little bit so they can develop and establish really well. All right, uh, normally I have my contact information here, but apparently I didn't put it in but you guys have all gotten it in your emails. And I'm gonna go.